Hello, everybody, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture Show. I am this program's co-host, DeSoto Brown, from Bishop Museum here in Honolulu. And joining us from Germany, his native homeland, is this program's actual host, Martin Despang. Martin, are you there? There he is. I am. Bright oh, and early. Bright and early your time. Hello. Afternoon for us. And today, we're going to be talking about horizontal high-rises. What, what are those? Let's jump into the first picture here and see. And see, okay. So, well, if you look so let's down stroll that a little street, bit mm -hmm. I was going to say, so that's Bethel Street, right? That's Bethel Street. If you look down Bethel Street, you think that it's just a normal downtown street, but as you pointed out, <laughs> next picture. There's something weird in the distance, yes. yeah, next picture. There it is. Wow, a little blurry, I have to zoom, and, but you know, it's a big thing. So let's go to the next slide already. So here it is, there's the city and then there's a ship. That's right. And don't be scared, it's not like in Speed 2 with Sandra Bullock, which we referenced at the top where a cruise ship runs into the city. <laughs> here it's sort of a friendly and peaceful coexistence between architecture and uh, cruise industry. And there's a whole tradition about that that we want to start out with. Let's go to the next slide. And this is our tropical tourism expert, Suzanne, when she was on the island uh, first, which is almost two decades ago, almost exactly two decades ago. And we were just cleaning out her basement and saw this postcard here, which dates back to 1999. And here you can see uh, the downtown skyline pretty much the way it is uh, today. Uh, and we see something in the foreground to the left, which is one of these cruise ships. But they don't look quite the way they look these days, the Soda, right? No. You were pointing this out. No, they do not. They look quite different. In fact. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. And... Again, you open your treasure box, your archive, yes, with these beautiful uh, impressions from the past. Yes. And here we can already see revealing that there is a company, Madsen, who was uh, basically starting this business, amongst other competitors, as you said, but yes. they were the main ones and the most successful ones. Yes. And here you can see how they're like portraying uh, this sort of mode of transportation as being very flamboyant, uh, very exclusive, we were saying before the show we were preparing, right? Because yeah. this wasn't for everyone. This was for Correct. very few people, privileged people, not only money-wise, but also time-wise, yes. right? Yes, exactly, because it took four days to get here, and then it took four days to get back to the West Coast. So you had eight to ten days just of transit time before you spent any time here in the Hawaiian Islands. And that meant that the only people who could take a ship vacation had a lot of free time. Quite luxurious. Let's jump to the next image here. And and this is, you know, Honolulu on boat day, and you told me that this was a big thing, boat day, way back. Yes. Not so much these days anymore. These big, big things come in and out, and, you know, people don't really recognize or pay any attention, but way back. And we can also see uh, something sticking out, and since the show is called Honolulu's Horizontal High Rises, here we can see a vertical high rise, and let's go to the next page, please, here, next slide. Referencing to a show you did not that long ago, you pointed out that Aloha Tower was in fact the first high rise on the island. Absolutely, that's Correct. right. And it was the tallest building in the Hawaiian Islands for quite some years, from the time it opened in 1926 up until uh, the middle 1950s, at 10 stories, it was the biggest mm -hmm. building there was. Mm -hmm. And then in contradiction, it's sort of vertical version of that, uh, sorry, horizontal version of that, we can see at the bottom right where the big cruise ships were docking at the pier that they built next to it. And let's move on to the next picture. Where, again, we see the, the these ships coming in and we see that uh, besides the lower tower, uh, downtown Honolulu is pretty horizontal, you know, it's pretty like two, three story buildings the most. So these ships were really, really, uh, you know, dominant and, and dominating uh, the, the skyline, right? 
Absolutely, and I think Which one of the things wasn't that, really a skyline yet. Yeah, it wasn't mm -hmm. a skyline, but I think something that we're going to come up to again is how many people were on these ships. There were more people on these ships than there were in most of those downtown buildings because the ship carried more people than were in the office buildings at the time. Well, well, that's a fascinating point. The next picture here. Uh, and again, the sort of fascination or obsession or fetishization with this sort of new means of transportation then also led to these very intriguing uh, artist um, renderings here, all hand drawn at that time because computer wasn't around yet, right? That's right, yeah. So they were sort of, they were, we were saying they were romanticizing this sort of new technology uh, of of boats not uh, running on wind anymore. Yes. The term trade winds comes from the, the sort of the more pre-contact or you know early post-contact uh, trades when they were setting sails at the Pacific Northwest and because of the wind direction coming from the Northeast, we're able to sail straight down. Right, right. that's right. And these are two pieces so of sheet music. The mm -hmm. These are songs yeah. uh, that have to do, Aloha Hawaii, mm -hmm. of course, associated with ships leaving. And then this other one is just using this wonderful vision of downtown Honolulu and Aloha Tower with the, stip, the ship steaming towards, right towards where we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And let's move on because you have more in your treasure box oh, yes. from these, here again, beautiful renderings portraying this sort of exotic obsession with this very tropical island, which you can access with a sort of modern technology yeah. at that time. Absolutely, with Aloha Tower Absolutely. again reappearing. Mm -hmm. Next slide. This is another great one we, we thought because it's sort of juxtaposing, you know, new technology, you know, being big with sort of pre-contact, being small, and the canoe and, you know, being wind powered, as we talked before, while the steamship is obviously run with fossil fuel, which way back one was very more excited about than these days, because in the meanwhile, we found out that it's not, you know, as, you know, beautiful as you might no. think in the long run no. about what it causes to the planet. No. Move on to the next slide. Uh, again, from your archive, these postcards where Madsen was celebrating, again, what they had. And, and you pointed out that especially the one on the left and probably the previous picture as well, they're really sort of superimposed and they're, they're sort of meant to look bigger than they actually already were, right? Correct, correct. And this is something and you that... Were, you were making a reference to my culture, right? Yes, in the I In the past. Yes, I was. Because this type of depiction of ships, passenger ships, is looking huge and heroic and beautiful as these uh, modern technological marvels is something that appeared in a lot of advertising during the pre-war period especially. And that's true not only of the United States and coming to the Hawaiian Islands, but in Europe as well. And Germany was a major builder of ships and had a number of major uh, shipping companies. And so travel posters from Germany use the same type of idiom of this magnificent ship coming towards the viewer to emphasize its speed, its size, and its technological uh, advancement. Yeah, and certainly not so beautiful as uh, part of my culture in the past. You know, the Third Reich and Hitler was yeah. wore into very monumental, yes. uh, you know, super big yes. megalomania. Yes, You know, exactly. the bigger the better, mm -hmm. and this super dome in Berlin that he, you know, proposed with his right. architect, right. Albert Speer. So again, that was that was the German, you know, the crazy German way. But you have this, as you said, all over the world, yeah. where the 30s were very heroic. Yes, there was a lot of yes. pathos in there. Yes. you know, a lot of pride, a lot of yes. sort of national nationalist, you know, feelings. And so again, America was showing off its power. Absolutely. And as you said, you know, they they were quite. You told me I didn't know that they were actually faster than the military ships. Yes, they were. Right? Yes, they were. So during World War II, all of the Matson ships in the Pacific got taken over by the U.S. Navy, and they traveled all around the world for the military. And those passenger ships, the Matson ships, were so much faster than any of the military ships, they never could travel with any other military ships trying to protect them during the war, because they'd go faster. So they really were technological mm -hmm. marvels, which nobody at the time 
had thought about as being useful for war purposes, but in fact, that's what ended up happening. Very interesting. So next picture. Um, and again, the reference at the top right is that at that time, it didn't take much longer for the aviation industry to basically take over, and that's what we have today. So the cruise ship industry is sort of marginalized and rather small compared to airplanes right. and, and big jumbos and airplanes bring in most people to our Hawaiian islands these days, right. while way back it was in fact these sort of cruise ships. Here. Absolutely. And as they were portraying here, Hawaii to, from, from Los Angeles, and again, you said, you know, it, it took quite a while, but way back, that was the fastest way to that get was. there. Right? That was, right. So four days, four days, five days, that's what it took to get here, as opposed to one mm -hmm, plane mm -hmm. trip that takes part of a day. Yeah, next slide. Again, let's go back to our days here and to contemplate a little bit sort of what relevance these things have in, in our uh, sort of contemporary Honolulu and project maybe they could be useful in some way, uh, a different way for the future, for the problems and challenges we have on our island these days. So this is, this is just us, you know, on a routine daily day in Honolulu when you get off one of the side streets that are, you know, approaching Nimitz Highway here and you see them. And again, they're, they're now almost like two or three times as tall as they were way back because we see the shipping terminal, which we talk about in a minute here, in the foreground, in the background, you see that monster, um, you know, with stacked floors and housing tons of people, which we're going to quantify in a little bit. So yeah. let's go to the next slide. <laughs> and we're going to talk about the, the issues with these things. And we were saying, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of you live very contained uh, for quite a while. So uh, this is a screenshotting a CNN report not that long ago about an epidemic uh, breaking out on one of these ships. And um, as you said, you know, there's a certain virus that just spreads and yeah. people can't get off, can't, you know, get away from each other. So basically pretty much everyone gets sick. That, yeah. that happens every now and yeah, then. Yeah, it does. And next picture, um, other things happen. And obviously, you know, talking big and megalomania and, and, and supersizing the Titanic was obviously is the epitome of, of that. And it took a, a tragic sort of end, as we know. Uh, you would think people would then learn from that and maybe stay smaller, but supersizing keeps on going. Uh, currently, uh, the biggest cruise ship, as this German article at the top right, and this is your, your weekly German lesson. That's what does right. that article say to Soto? Uh, well, I figured out it says the biggest cruise ship in the world. And then I believe you told me it's being built in that place in Germany, whatever place that is. Yeah, that's in Wismar. That's a coastal town here. And they say in the article that as of now, the largest one is the Harmony of the Sea. And that's a proud American ship. And it, it houses uh, six and a half thousand people. Now that, you know, the next superpower might be someone else. So China is catching up and, uh, so they have commissioned uh, the next largest ship that houses almost 10,000 people, nine and a half thousand uh, guests on it. And it's in fact being built by Germans in this sort of traditional shipmaking place close to the uh, North Sea, which is part of the Atlantic, um, which is where the Titanic sank, right? And, yeah, and you nice. have some family uh, relationship yes, yes. to that tragic yes, uh, my, accident, right? My grandmother's uncle and cousin first cousin were both killed on the on the uh ground on the titanic because they were both men and so they gave up their seats in the lifeboat to women and then they went down with the ship gentlemen 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 right. yes. they were self-sacrificing remembered for that always and forever yeah yep. thank you for sharing so next slide and, and to these days, things like that, this is, uh, again, tropical tourist expert Suzanne in her native uh, Bavaria here. This is our uh, most prominent newspaper that you can buy nationally, the Southern German uh, magazine here. And the title story not that long ago was this sort of Norwegian cruise ship 
that got into trouble because there was a big storm and you remember the the engines uh, basically were out and so they were just like floating there amongst the full forces of nature right yes that's right it's not and always fun on a cruise ship no and next picture uh, there's tragedies on different levels. I mean, the previous one were on big scale, epidemic, and you know, getting into uh, problems with 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 storms. But also, um, you know, there's an unproportional high number of personal tragedies on um, on cruise ships. And I was throwing in this here as a reference or a contribution from my culture. And you. Being a good investigator, you looked this up, and what did you find? Well, well, I discovered that this man who uh, disappeared from the ship was a singer who became popular in a German TV show that's kind of like, uh, you know, become a star type of America thing. America's superstar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And ironically enough, at this ship that has this great big, happy, smiling red lips on the front of it, he jumped off of it, and the, the ship was off the coast of Canada, and the ocean was too cold for him to have survived, even if he wanted to. So. As you said, here's a personal single tragedy as opposed to a mass tragedy. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then uh, switching subject back to architecture, so sort of the red on the white body of the ship mm -hmm. reminded you of something that we go to the next slide here, that while um, cruise ships are for the very obvious reasons of speed streamlined, Architecture in the same era of the 1930s and then later 40s and 50s with these glorious industrial designers like Norman Bel Geddes or Raymond Lowy basically started to streamline buildings as well. So the building at the top you contributed, you know, the Coca-Cola building has these attributes of obviously white and then horizontal lines and then the typical for ships uh, round windows in it. But also, uh, we, I always, when I drive by, I find a very streamlined, which is the building at the bottom, which is the Department of Transportation, the the Harbor Division, and that's basically the, the front end of that cruise ship terminal that we were talking about before. And you reminded us with um, impressions from your archive how that looked previous to this condition that we still have. And let's bring the next slide up and tell us a little about it. Well, originally the, the docks that were at the base of Aloha Tower were piers 8, 9, 10, and 11, and they were all built in the middle 1920s. And originally, Pier 11 extended all the way up to Queen Street, and that's what you see in the picture in the upper mm -hmm. left. Then in 1952, Nimitz Highway was constructed, and they actually went through that part of that part of the terminal of Pier 11, so they actually cut it off. So that's what you can see in those two aerial photographs that part of the building being cut off, and then the streamlined part being built in 1952. And in the top picture, there's an inset to the right of it that you can see there's the mats and smokestack peeking over the top of the pier. And you can compare that for the ships of that time period to what the ships look like today in the pictures you've just seen and how much bigger they are. Exactly, and that makes us jump to the next picture here and sort of slowly but surely phasing up and concluding in the show with some polemic propositions here and returning to tropical tourist expert Suzanne here who's always interested in the sort of exotic erotic aspect of what draws people to Hawaii and what the tourist industry does to sort of foster and fuel that sort of dream and selling these dreams and here is obviously the exotic it's the local girls it's you know, tanned skin, and it's surfers, and it's palm trees, and it's lays, and it's all of that and more. And this is what Matt was dwelling upon yeah. quite heavily in the yes. past. Yes, yes it was. So, so next slide. And these days, unfortunately, there is not so much left of that. I really love that uh, postcard on the, on the left, talking Art Deco and Streamline. The typeface and everything is sort of portraying that. But when you go through our contemporary downtown Honolulu and Oahu and the Hawaiian Islands in general, not much of that is left, uh, nor look the cruise ships elegant anymore. But again, well, there's a correlation between architecture and, and, and the cruise ships. The cruise ships were elegant way back in architecture was mid-century, which we always point out also in the parallel Docomomo shows. 
But buildings, high rises, or nor cruise ships don't look that elegant anymore these days. And I get sentimental often. So there's this catamaran here in the front on the right picture that I was mistaking for Henry J. One of Henry J. Kaiser's catamarans, and you and Don ever taught me it's not. This is in fact from the 70s. But at least it has a. A, a, a Tiki statue there that actually we're going to do another show about this Tiki. We call it Tiki Tolkien, so you guys be excited about that one. Yeah. So next uh, slide here. Um, there is, you know, these days you can't get around looking at the environmental impact of things in architecture. We, you know, make this um, a driving force in the project that we're proposing that we call Primitivas. And in one of the previous slides, I we forgot to point out that when it comes to emissions, cruise ships are actually worse than airplanes that we know are already bad. Yes. Right. So here, you know, we took this picture with a, with a ship sort of neatly nestling in, in nature, but in fact, when it comes to its carbon footprint, it's quite the opposite. So let's go to the next slide. And this is all permanent background that we choose that so romantically, almost in a silly, naive way, portrays how these ships come in and the locals and the water. But again, in, in fact, when we go to the next slide, um, reality is different. Uh, I used to have a place here at the North Sea. At uh, This is at the city of Cuxhaven, which is sort of the entry of the River Elbe, leading to the uh, large harbor the city of Hamburg, and uh, they were rebooting the um, basically the, the the Queen Mary, uh, so which is like the modern version of the Titanic, and that one is coming in from New York over the Atlantic Ocean, heading to Hamburg here. And I did in the previous show uh, days of urban transcendence, I had Annette de uh, walk us through a um, a new uh, neighborhood that we compared to Kakaako. We called the show uh, Hamburg's Harbor City, um, Germany's uh, Kakaako, and and so um, we're pointing out similarities between the two. So if you go to the next slide, we pointed out a project where architecture sort of took advantage of the uh, of the urban the, the large carbon footprint of these cruise ships. Because the Queen Mary, because of the Queen Mary, there's the project left of the ship at the bottom, and that's called the Marco Polo Tower and the Unilever Building by Danish Architects. And they proposed a double facade um, to basically get the fresh air from a, um, a, a duct that's underground, and it takes it in from further away, the clean air, so the people who work in the offices can actually work, uh, open their window and breathe fresh air, which they couldn't if they would be sort of unprotectedly be exposed to the smokestack of the Queen Mary. That's quite scary, right? Yes, so next is. picture. So if we think what that means for our, you know, paradise and, and sort of there's hope here where the, uh, the uh, industry, the, the ship industry is looking into sort of um, innovating the tradition of wind powered, and we assume here it's not direct as in the old days with the wind blowing into the sail, but it's wind turbines that um, you know run a generator and create the electricity or the power to to run the ships. So there's some hope on that on that end. We were pointing out in the aviation show that algae might be a fuel for airplanes, so we could grow that thanks to our climate on Hawaii and basically fuel our own airplanes hopefully in the yes. future. Yes. Next slide. And again, two of your beautiful postcards again. Uh, romantic, romantic, the cruise ships, and uh, how can we bring back romanticism, but maybe not in a sentimental way, next picture, because our problems on the island are different these days, and I want to share here a recent trip I did to the most exotic island in Europe that's as far south as you can get, that's the, the island of Malta, and you pointed out that the skyline looks quite like the one that we had in these pioneering yeah, days. That's right. In way back, but not like the ones that we have today, and in fact, next slide. Um, the combination of pictures here, I was there with my son and daughter-in-law who are venturing out for a cosmopolitan culinary 
um, um, uh, adventure there on the island of Malta. And on the airplane, I found this magazine that was uh, telling that there are 30 towers on the, mm. on the Maltese islands, and this is historic towers. And what you see here in the pictures on the left, as desperately as we're trying in Honolulu, we're trying to make vertical housing, but not always do we do a good job architecturally, nor in Honolulu these days. We did mid-century, which we point out and celebrate, but not so much these days anymore, and not so much in Malta, unfortunately, yeah. these days. Yeah. Next, yeah. Next picture. And uh, this is me flying to Malta, and you see the whole island. It's a little bit sort of reverse, uh, where uh, the urban part is in the, in the north, uh, the city of Valletta, and, and to the south is basically where the industrial and the harbor area is, and where this sort of the cartoon basically shows the cruise ship here docking. Uh, and go to the next slide. And here, this is their place, uh, very gritty, nice um, Mediterranean um, scenery. And, you know, from the rooftops, which they, by the way, are heavily sort of inhabiting the people there, uh, you can see the, the cruise scenario and the, the cruise panoramic being quite there and quite in front of your face. Next picture. Uh, which you might think is a bad thing, but this one here is an urban piazza here where you can see it sort of neatly fits in and doesn't look like something like an eyesore that usually you want to sort of, you know, keep away from tourists. But here it seems to be a, a good symbiosis between urban life and the sort of, you know, technology that we seem to need to, uh, you know, live and survive comfortable on remote islands. True. So right. we... We conclude with a polemic proposition now with our concluding slide here, uh, next one and last one, where we were saying we've been looking into um, not just cruise ships, but also cargo ships quite a bit, and we've been proposing um, to do housing out of them, and not just on land, but here we're referring to, again, a previous show from Urban Transcendent with Hans Slavik, who many considered to be the Pope of shipping container architecture, and he in fact wrote with his students the very first textbook about it. And he also built, which you can see in the centerpiece here, for the International Building Exhibition in Hamburg, he built this sort of floating uh, ponton uh, in the water with shipping containers. So we're saying, you know, with the dramatic shortage of affordable housing we have on the islands, and that we're struggling to, to build on the island, and if we're doing, we're not doing it the best way, maybe then another way would be to build another city in front of the city and basically use, I mean, cruise ships are pretty much floating hotels or floating apartments to begin with, right? Yes. But they seem to need to go away and come back, while containers often are out commissioned and put out of service, so maybe you keep them on up commission ships and you build sort of a neighborhood, you space them out a little bit more and people could live, you know, and, and floating, you know, around uh, sand islands. That's right. So that's just an another weird idea that we have to uh, use this sort of um, typology um, to maybe help our urgent pressing needs on the island, which is first and foremost, again, housing, housing. for the many who can't really afford it anymore. True. Well, that brings us to the end of the program today. And I uh, hope you enjoyed Honolulu's horizontal high rises, floating horizontal high rises. Uh, Martin will be back in the near future. I'll be back in the near future for more Think Tech shows. And until then, everybody, thank you for watching. Aloha. Bye-bye.